One of my favorite tweets of all time describes the history of Western art in seven words. Uh, a friend is taken to the National Gallery and they come out saying, well, that's Western art for you. A thousand years of crucifixions, then stripes. Uh, now, that's incredibly reductionistic. Did I mention that this is Twitter? Um, but as a summary of Western art in seven words, it's really hard to top it. I mean, have you been to the National Gallery as everybody is on their slow marathon walking past the sacred art? What is sacred art? Well, you can go to the Sainsbury wing right there and you can see depiction after depiction after depiction of death by torture. And there we are in the climate controlled galleries, uh, basically sighing to ourselves saying, ah, sacred art. This is odd, right? To imagine that death by torture could be art, that is subversive enough. But to imagine that its victim is God himself, that is the most subversive claim in the whole world. And yet, this is at the heart of our world. At the heart of our world is an Easter uprising. That the one who died that weekend has in fact made our world. Tom Holland, the historian, he has called Christianity a revolution. And he says it is the most disruptive, it is the most influential, it is the most enduring revolution in human history. And what I want to do is take us on a journey from the sacred art of the National Gallery as we all gaze at death by torture. I want to go back to Rome. I want to go back to the place where the preaching of that cross first made contact. And to figure out if I was in Roman sandals, how would the preaching of the cross actually strike me? Let's have a look. And that's just the Citizens Advice Bureau. Amazing. Hey, welcome to Rome, eternal city. Here is Caesar Augustus, the one famous from Luke chapter two, who made a decree. And uh, Christmas all unrolled from there. Augustus had his forum just back there, and uh, the Temple of Mars was the main feature of, uh, of the forum of Augustus. Mars kind of gave birth to this city. Mars raped Rhea Silvia. She gave birth to twins, Romulus and Remus. They were exposed, thrown away, as um, so many children were in the ancient world. They were raised by wolves, covered by a shepherd, and they would go on to become bandits. In the end, Romulus kills Remus, and he is the one who founds this city. So Rome, very much a town who has its origins in rape and murder and war. Um, and yet this is the city in which the preaching of Jesus Christ really makes an impact, especially in the first and second centuries. And what we want to do is figure out how does the Christmas child and the preaching of Christ on the cross, how does it impact an ancient culture that is built on war and rape and murder? We're going to go to the Colosseum and find out. So welcome to the Colosseum. It could hold 50,000 plus spectators coming to cheer on the gladiatorial games. They did game shows a little bit differently. Squid Game was for real uh, back in the Roman Empire. Although apparently I just learned that back in the day it was free entry. I had to pay 36 euros to get in and uh, I haven't seen a fatality yet. But here we are, we live in hope. Um, Imagine the scene, okay, you've got the opening salvo was maybe this giant seesaw with two guys kind of tied on and one guy is down below and he springs up and then the other guy comes down. Then release the beast. And what happens when the beasts are released? Well, they start tearing at the guy down below. What does he do? He springs up and he sends his friend down into the claws and the teeth and the blood and the gore and the crowd is going nuts, you know. Are you not entertained? That's that, that is the entertainment. Then the next thing, maybe there would be a bull released onto a woman and the beast tamers, the bestiari, they claimed that they could 
train a bull, for instance, to mount its victim before goring it to death. All of this was in honor of the gods who took the form of beasts in order to rape mortals. That's just how the gods roll. And everybody loved it. This was entertainment. And then maybe dotted around the edges were some crucifixions. I mean, that's not the most spectacular death. Obviously, it's a very slow death. And yet, there would be the crucifixions. Into this culture, you get the preaching of Christians who are saying, you know what? Our God is the creator of all. He's not like Mars and Jupiter and Apollo. And yet, the thing that sets him apart is that he showed up on a cross. He showed up right at the, the, the bottom of the pile. And you think, what kind of God looks like that? That is not very entertaining. So how did the preaching of the cross of Jesus sound to Roman ears? Let's find out. So the thing that really struck me from the Colosseum was they've still got a cross up in the Colosseum. And my reaction was probably the same as the reaction of every other tourist who comes there. Oh, they put a religious symbol at the heart of the Colosseum. Today, a Christian people frequently assemble here where early martyrs gave their lives for their faith. They give witness to the enduring quality of faith while the barbaric Colosseum crumbles. And of course, they didn't put a religious symbol at the heart of the Colosseum. They put a cross, which in its true context is an implement of torture, and it's part of the entertainment, right? And it's the slow death. You know, you, you, want, you want to mix things up fast and slow when you've got your gladiatorial games. You have some people who die really quick, and you'll have those who are crucified who are taking days to gasp their last breath. And so the cross, what it meant back in the first, second centuries, and what it meant to the, the preachers of the first Christian gospel here in Rome, that is quite a clash. And what we're going to see next, we're going to go to the Palatine Hill Museum and we'll see the way in which the preaching of the cross sounded to Roman ears. Let's have a look. So how did the preaching of the cross sound to Romans in the first and second centuries? Well, we don't need to guess. There is the Alexamenos Graffito. It is the first depiction of the crucifixion and it depicts Jesus with the head of a donkey and Alexamenos is raising a hand in veneration. And the, the, the caption just says, Alexamenos worships his God. Now it's very difficult for comedy to stand up over the years and yet this comedy really hits the spot. The, the satire bites. Alexamenos worships his donkey God because that's the only kind of God who would descend all the way down to a cross. And when you see this kind of depiction of the cross, you recognize what a transformation has happened when these days we look at a cross and we think it's a symbol of God's presence in suffering, a symbol of God's peace in pain. And yet for a first century Roman, what, what was the cross? The cross was an implement of torture. It's a method of execution. It is a horror. It was not to be found on Roman lips. The idea that a God or the God would show up as its victim was scandalous. But that scandal became the central proclamation of the Jesus revolution. A movement was built saying that this victim on the cross was in fact the victor over death and evil, over the whole world. And the message took hold. By 312 AD, Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. He was backing a winning horse because Christianity was rising up. By 380, half the empire had converted. The Jesus movement bedded down to take over the world. That's why Tom Holland calls Christianity the most disruptive, the most influential and the most enduring revolution in history. The Easter uprising is the most surprising and the most significant event in all our lives. From the cross, there has risen up a unique vision of goodness and truth and beauty. So here we are at St. Peter's and 
It's built on the site of the execution of Peter. His tomb is supposedly here. A man who was crucified upside down for following Jesus in the way of the cross. And he experienced the cross the way everybody in the ancient world experienced the cross, as a mode of torture and execution. And yet, here is one of the most famous churches in the world built on its site. So here is St. Andrew, who was crucified on the X-shaped cross in Greece. First century follower of Jesus, and notice how the cross there is rugged and wooden. That's, that's what the old style crosses were. They, these are implements of torture and execution, and they've preserved that there. Andrew dies in that way. But that's the old rugged kind of cross. Look around this building, look around St. Peter's, and the whole building is in the shape of a cross, the most ornate cross you've ever seen. There's crosses everywhere. Everyone's signing themselves with the sign of the cross. They're wearing crosses. How have we gone from that to this? What's happened? What has happened to turn this implement of torture into a sign of God's peace in the darkness, a sign of God's presence even in suffering? That's some revolution. How do you go from God-forsaken execution to world domination? That's some transformation. You know, I don't know if you believe in miracles, like the famous miracle that Jesus did turning water into wine. I don't know if you think that actually happened. Here's a miracle that has definitely happened. Jesus has turned God-forsaken execution into world domination. I've written a book about it. It's called The Air We Breathe. And in it, I talk about seven different values that we now take utterly for granted. We as a culture have for 2,000 years been contemplating you know, this figure on the cross. Here's how it happens. You look in the ancient world at a kind of a hierarchical structure that is all about inequality. And Jesus shows up at the bottom of that hierarchy and he dies the slave's death, upending all our inequality. Suddenly we start going from not believing in equality to, to believing in equality. That's some uprising. We used to think that greatness was about dominance. And then all of a sudden, the great one, Jesus Christ, comes and he serves. Suddenly, it's all about compassion. Jesus comes as the ultimate victim in order to value victims and the marginalized. And suddenly, we start believing in consent. We used to believe that a culture grows by the sword, by force. And then all of a sudden, we realize that the great one actually takes the sword into himself and spreads his kingdom through enlightenment. We used to think that you would just believe in the stories that are told by the gods on high. And then the God who is on high came to be dissected on full display in, in front of the world. And, and now we start believing in testing things. We start to believe in science. We used to believe in slavery. And then the God of heaven shows up as the slave of all and dies the slave's death so that we might be invited into the family. Suddenly we start believing in freedom. And then what about the value of progress? We used to think that things just got worse from a higher state. And then Jesus plumbed our depths and rose up again on Easter Sunday. And all of a sudden we believe that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Jesus has given us belief in all these different values that are the air that we breathe today. If you want to find out more, I've written a book called The Air We Breathe. And it's all about this Easter revolution. Keep on meditating on the cross. Maybe he's more than a victim. Maybe he is the victor. And when you start realizing that, you start getting to grips with the Easter uprising that has built your world.